the good thing is this is an actual talk that people in Germany can now get to also see. So um, I do know a couple of people are going to watch. So okay, we are live because so whenever people are ready. Okay, hello everyone. Thanks very much for coming uh, and everyone's attending online as well. Um, it's quite a nice situation actually. I think we've got a sort of intimate discussion group here in the room and it's a much larger uh, audience uh, online. My name is uh, Chris Williams and I'm a lecturer here at the University of Glasgow and it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lars Schmeink, um, who is currently the visiting leading professor of German studies. Uh, visiting from his position as a research fellow at the Hoburg University of Lensburg. Um, he has recently concluded his work as principal investigator of the federally funded science fiction subproject, the Future Work Network, an interdisciplinary research group working on the development of work and society. Um, and in 2010, this is a sort of mainstay of the science fiction scene. In 2010, he inaugurated the first German academic organization dealing with research in the plastic. And he served as its president for 10 years. I was going to have a go at the name of that. Gesellschaft für Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, he is the author of Biopunk Dystopias, published in 2016, uh, the co editor of a number of books, uh, Cyberpunk and Visual Culture, 2018, The Rutledge Companion of Cyberpunk Culture, 2020. And most recently, uh, 50 Key Figures in Cyberpunk Culture with Alan Carlin and Greg J. Murphy, which is published by Rob Lynch this year. And New Perspectives on Contemporary German Science Fiction by Ingo Collins, and that's published by Carl Grid, uh, also out this year. And if everyone would like to join me in welcoming the last uh, Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, hello and welcome to everyone uh, on the screens. This is uh, the, the chance to see this talk as an actual uh, um, live streaming. And um, we, we did agree on we're going to take this and then put it online uh, later this year. Right? So um, in case somebody doesn't get a chance today. Um, so when preparing for this talk, I was a little bit unsure as to how much my audience actually knew about German science fiction. And I mean that as Ingo Cornus explains, German studies has a blind spot when it comes to speculative literature. And on the other way around, the same goes for science fiction studies, which usually doesn't see the German contribution to what science fiction does. So there are several reasons for what we call this double absence. And uh, Why is it not moving now? Of course, it's not moving now. <laughs> okay, I'll do it this way. Yeah. Um, so there's a, there are several reasons for this double absence. On the one hand, uh, Ingo Gomez talks about Vergangenheitsbewältigung as being one of the uh, the key features of, of German literary studies. Um, the distinction between serious literature and entertainment literature that is still something that's going on in German. Um, in German studies as well, which usually classifies as, as escapist as best or unreadable trash at worst. So if you kind of have that opinion of SF, then obviously you're not going to look at it. Uh, and there's also a lack of available translations, which is usually where people would find their reading material they can't because German SF isn't really being translated. So I don't make it my job as a Libyan professor to go out and to promote German SF. That's kind of what I, I figured I would do with this. So this is what this talk will do. Um, more specifically, I want to know how the genre is changing. I want to look at how it evolves to reflect an open and new German society. Um, how it acknowledges that certain voices have not been heard and how those voices add actually to our understanding of what SF could do. So I started off with a little look at what SF has been doing so far. Wrong one. <laughs> um, in Out of This World, Rachel Cardasco discusses international SF traditions through the lens of English language translations. It is fair to say that those authors getting a translation are likely the ones that are more known, the more successful, and in a way, the more representative of the genre. 
Um, so here's the list of authors that Cordasco mentions for SF in Germany, starting with the founding father Kurt Laswitz and the post World War II generation of Herbert Franke and Hans Jünger. She continues with Wolfgang Jeschke, Andreas Eschbach, Frank Schelsing, and Dietmar Dart. And I'm seeing a pattern here. I don't know if you are, but I am. <laughs> so maybe this is a bias in translation. Maybe, you know, translation publishing has a look for a specific type. So let's add in the winners of the most, <coughs> the most prestigious literary award that an SF novel could get, the Kurt Laspitz Prize for Best Novel in SF. <laughs> This would be Johann Hans Joachim Albers, Uwe Post, Tom Hildenbrand, Andreas Brandkost, and Michael Marak. So lots of diversity there. But to be fair, there's one name that I'm not mentioning from Cardasco's list, and that is Yun C, whose novel The Method is actually mentioned because it's one translated. But unfortunately, C is actually not a genre author. And she wrote one literary allegory of medical authoritarianism. All of her other books are not even close to this. So Counting her as an SF novelist is kind of off. And the other person here on the list is Gudrun Pausewang, the only woman to ever win the last bits for best novel in 1988. So the one and only woman. So my argument is that German SF can be quite conservative. Um, the majority of these writers would not really be the ones to shake up traditions or depict a radical change in society. They can, and some do, sometimes in some form. And to be clear, this is not the fault of any individual author, um, but they benefit from the structures that are there in place in German SF publishing. These authors here are the ones that get translated, they get the awards and sell the books. So it's obvious that German SF has a diversity issue and does not really represent the changing reality of German society. Um, its futures are anchored in the world of whiteness, androcentrism, and heteronormativity. So this is where the revolution comes in. And in 2020, when the Black author James Sullivan sent out a tweet about his latest fantasy novel, he claimed that it would be progressive high fantasy. He expanded this idea by saying he was wanting to write a classic Tolkien-inspired book, but one for today's world, discussing where the non-male, the non-white perspectives are. So progressive for him literally means to move forward. And the term seemed to resonate so well with other authors that it became the progressive fantastic. It's an umbrella term that's been used as a Twitter handle that's been kind of embraced a little bit further than that. So together with non-binary author Judith Fult, Sullivan then wrote a piece that solidified these ideas. It loosely defines what is meant as by a progressive approach. Sullivan and Fult argue that traditions can be so entrenched that they are in the way of representing current reality. They can block us, limit us, or even hurt us. Consequently, the progressive fantastic breaks with these traditions on all levels, prompting authors to leave behind the obsolete and ill-fitting ones. And the new kind of writing that should be this, that it is promoted in this piece is progressive political concepts such as feminism and diversity and the use of critical reflection to analyze the traditions that we have and which we still value, whereas the others that we need to discard in order to kind of get to this, representing this changing social reality. So in my talk, I will investigate the claims of the progressive fantastic by example of science fiction. I read Sullivan's City of Symbiotes as an Afrofuturist exploration of belonging and of living a marginalized life complicit with the oppressors. Unit and Christian Fultz, wife and husband writing team, explore queer linguistics and queer communities in their post apocalyptic wasteland and in their space opera, Ace in Space. Lena Richter discusses issues of disability and neurodivergence in her stories, Fire and 3.78 Credit Points. And lastly, Teresa Hamlich reinvigorates the almost forgotten genre of utopia in her latest novel, Pantopia. Unfortunately, none of these have been translated so far. So you need to read German to read this. But we'll try and figure something out there. So let's start with James Sullivan, whose, civil, uh, whose novel City of Simians is a reflection on Sullivan's complicated relation of, to issues of race and his exploration of Afrofuturism. In an interview, Sullivan explains that he comes to Afrofuturism via his Amer African American heritage 
which he feels deeply about in historical terms. So he says, I cannot get over the history of slavery there. It's like a mountain range. There is no pass to get to the other side. Born in the US, Sullivan lived his whole life in Germany and approaches Afrofuturism by a feelings of diaspora, by issues of isolation, alienation, and dislocation. It is his unique position um, of a Black German writer that makes Sullivan's voice an important part of the progressive fantastic. He explores issues of race and racism, otherwise ignored in German SF, and this Afrofuturism that allows him to engage in the ambiguities of his diasporic heritage and feelings of belonging to a structurally racist German society. So for those of you unfamiliar with the term, Afrofuturism was codified by Mark Derry in 1993 as speculative fiction that treats African-American themes and addresses African-American concerns in the context of 20th century technocultures. It has since been kind of broadened, adapted, riffed upon, expanded by a lot of authors, but it remains central to the understanding of the relationship between Black cultures and SF. So here I would like to refer to Isaiah Lavanda's exploration of Afrofuturism as a narrative practice that enables users to communicate the interconnection between science, technology, and race across centuries, continents, and cultures. So it's a bit broader than, than uh, Derry's trip. Lavanda's central thesis is that the Black experience has always been an experience of spatial and temporal dislocation and disorientation. So in short, Lavanda argues that the Black experience is science fictional and that Afrofuturism is one way to communicate and explore these experiences. And Sullivan's novel is actually Afrofuturist in exploring a technological future as much as it negotiates the Black experience of diaspora and disorientation in a society of oppression. So a short summary and a little warning that I will later have to spoil the story to analyze it, so I will give you a heads up. Um, the city described in the novel is Gascanvas, a refugee city that was founded when the alien invaders came to wage war on Earth, stripped of all its resources, and enslaved the humans. A last remnant of humanity escaped to Antarctica and founded a city under a shield dome run by powerful AI. The story follows Gamil, a young and very talented symbiont, a post-human with technological implants, Gamil follows a strange signal and finds Nenemula, one of the founders of the city who has been in deep sleep for 500 years. She has awakened because she found out the truth that the AIs that run the city actually use the users, uh, the sleeper's brains as processing power and keep the awake population under control via implanted modules in their symbiotic implants. So Nenemula and Gamil will need to free the population that is being oppressed without them knowing. And of course the city figures them as terrorists and hunts them all the while. So while not openly talking about Black experience, the novel discusses the issues of otherness and oppression. Because of the setting, this canvas can be argued to be somewhat post-racial. But since racism is a systemic issue, the one that is linked to what Nicola Laure al Samarai and Peggy Fischi call the structural equipment to dominate, categorize, and order the world, the reader soon notices other aspects of inequality. There is a marked difference between non-modified humans and symbionts who have been implanted what is referred to the machinery. And while the AIs run the day-to-day -day of the city, only the symbionts interact with them and the infrastructure on a technological level. Further, the symbionts control the faculties, the intellectual centers that research specific fields of knowledge need for the city and the AIs. Power structures do not map easily onto existing categories of oppression or racism specifically, Instead, they complicate the notion of hegemonic discourse. At first glance, it seems that society is divided along the lines of symbionts and non-modified. But when Nanmura awakes and reveals that all symbionts are influenced by control modules, the power dynamic shifts. Some symbionts carry favor with the existing hegemonic structures and use the divide to disseminate false information through smoke screens and leverage more control and power for themselves. So typical political politics. Sullivan uses the technology of the machinery as an Afrofuturist metaphor for the complacency and unwitting participation of, in systems of oppression. The structural equipment of hegemony, the technological infrastructure, is under the control of the AIs and those that willingly go along with oppressing the people. 
So here's how the literalizes what the vendor refers to as the dreadfully marginalizing system of thought control in regard to both individuals and society. Um, but Sullivan injects a utopian moment via Afrofuturism. Lavender argues that the African American experience of chattel slavery led to the creation of Afrofuturist methods of resistance, one of which is the black, ne black networked consciousness, which links past, present, and future, which connects individual members of the network like a circuitry. And this network is through communal interaction able to force uh, social change by technocultural and techno spiritual means. Sullivan explores black network consciousness by having a black woman, Nermura, become the network leader. She is the founder of faculties of 500 years of experience, bringing with her old communal memories of the pain of founding the city. She provides the tools to build a secret communication network and shares them with the younger generation. She forces social change by removing the control modules. And she literally wakes everyone up to the reality of oppression. The woke then form a network of consciousness, coordinating their efforts for social change, waking other sleepers, and tapping into past communal knowledge and memories. The extended metaphor of the machinery inside the symbion's head might be a bit blunt, but it is effective in communicating the feeling of waking up in a very comfortable life to realize that one has been unwittingly complicit in the upholding of control structures, of systems of oppression, it is similar to the image shared by Beverly Tatum of the moving walkway of institutional racism, which will carry you with it unless you actively turn around and move against it. Waking up to the movement of the walkway is not enough. You need to do something. And Sullivan makes this clear as well. Um, just knowing about the modules does not suffice. You need to actively remove them from your own head. And in the novel, that is under pressure and against the actions of the system to keep them there. And spoiler alert, right? So next part, turn, maybe turn out for a minute or so. Um, instead of leaving it at, I did not know I had a chip in my head which made me overlook oppression, which kind of describes what most white people experience in our systemically racist society, Sullivan actually points out that black people, or in this case, the others, right, um, can be just as unwittingly complicit with the system. Um, at the end of the story, the rebellion against the AIs is, is successful, and the citizens of Yaskandlis take back control over their lives only to realize one central important detail that they're not really on Earth. That they're living, that they are a living computer circuitry of an invading space force of AI mining the galaxy. Unfortunately, their ship was shot down at some point, and the humans were needed for the AIs to survive. They have been complicit with the invasion, exploitation, and oppression of other species for hundreds of years. So here Sullivan connects technological images with the ideas of invasion and settlement, evoking a kind of a middle passage of humans as cargo, linking it to the matrix of ideas of humans as computers. So Sullivan connects past, present, and future, revealing the painful truth that everyone has been complicit in an exploitative system that there's no escaping this oppressive system unless you feel solidarity with all. So the people of Yaskandras at the end of the novel will have to make the decision of how to react, of how to approach the other exploited species that live on this world. This is the story that unsettles the status quo, gives voice to marginalized groups, and opens up a perspective that is very uncomfortable for most German readers. It's in the best sense of the word than a progressive SF story. Another aspect that is key to the progressive fantastic is the issue of representation of women and non-binary authors. And because German is, linguistically speaking, a gendered language, the challenges to find a non-heteronormative language are high. Authors Judith and Christian Fold have been experimenting with ways to make their texts non-heteronormative and have become quite the trailblazers. Their 2019 novel, Wasteland, is the first speculative novel in German that employs queer linguistic strategies to create non-heteronormative language. There's not a single use of the generic masculine form typically used in German. To describe non-binary characters, the authors use the neo-pronoun sehr, which conflates the German words for he and she. Uh, the folks author, and uh, the folks further employ 
what Heiko Motschenbacher refers to as subversive practices of linguistic gender crossing. So in a term like boss, which in German is on several levels gender masculine, and they actually use feminine markers, um, which you can see here on the, on the screen, um, which then breaks with the reader expectation and thus spotlights the heteronormativity that German language usually has. And lastly, in some instances, even um, the folks erase gender completely by using or referring to non and neutral terms like teaching person instead of the gender teacher. So in German, every profession is basically gendered. Uh, the female uh, version usually gets an IN ending and then it becomes female. So they are, they are then, and they're using Lea has a woman instead, um, which is an interesting step. So, um, in their next novel, Ace and Space from 2020, Hubert uh, and Christian Funk use a similar queer linguistic repertoire, but change some of the strategies. And they're actually playfully exploring different options to show that non heteronormativity is possible and very different in many forms. So instead of Zia, they employ the term Zier as a neo pronoun for non binary characters. Um, since there is no official consensus of which term is correct, the zero form is probably the most accepted among those self-identifying as NY. So incidentally, more NY characters are represented in the novel. Um, social media person Inko, mind worker Noor, pilot idol Judge Dawson. These characters are described by neologisms and through neutralizing gender forms such as logarithms or mix, uh, which make use of the X suffix instead of the gendered uh, forms that German usually applies. So instead of Mr. or Mrs., it's mix, um, which makes uh, more sense in German um, if, you, if you look at this. So in addition, the epicene term person is used in very different situations, which signal it's kind of ubiquitous usage, right? So there's on the one hand, there's uh, the employment of a lot of gravitas when we're talking about Richtperson, which means judge, right? So, in a very official term, or the very lighthearted and, and almost funny version of the online user, cow person instead of cowboy. Um, so, gender crossing is also more pronounced and combined with the use of English slang terminology of pandas and social media jargon. So, terms like president and jockey, which remain English in German but are gendered masculine, um, are here used with feminine inflection. Uh, in addition, the folks even explore the possibility of gender splitting via the use of the colon as it is used in written language. Thus, in intradiagetic emails, they signal a normalcy of an acceptance of gender neutral terminology. So, the different strategies are employed in the text to playfully highlight that there are several options to eliminate heteronormative language and its use of binarism. A future society, they remind us, should have found ways to eliminate this linguistically. Thus, Wasteland and Ace in Space show that queer linguistics can successfully be used in novels and signal a future that is not dependent on the binary perspective of gender and sex. The novels do not stop at language, though, but extend their queer approach into the world building through the, and the introduction of queer communities. And I refer you to the definition of queer as proposed by uh, Eve Kozowski Sedwich. Um, as continuing moment movement motive that works across categories and is multiply transitive. The open mesh of possibilities, gaps, overlaps, dissonances, and resonances, lapses, and excesses of meaning. So the folks communities explore queerness by promoting an inclusive approach to basically any form of personal identity. In the intersectionality of ethnicity, gender, sex, disability, age, or mental health. So in Wasteland, for example, the authors describe a post-apocalyptic world that is ruled mainly by motorcycle gangs like the Bros, which favor very steep power structures in a culture of violence and domination. And they're referred to in the novel as toxins. In contrast, the trading community of the handbound market is a group of hopers assembled into patchwork families and sharing values of respect and inclusivity. So interestingly, the folks do not limit their queer approach to the hopers. Both communities are shown to be post-racial societies. Both are aware of queerness. Even among the brokes, oppression of race, sex, and gender have been overcome. Their language is just as inclusive. It's normal even for toxins to accept self-identification, for example, as in every conversation, we ask for his name and pronouns. 
When another toxin refuses to grow your gender and ridicules it, and later his lower extremities get amputated, the broke shaman thinks, well, maybe now we will learn that you don't need to, to use the pronoun he. The contrast of violence and gender inclusive worldview here highlight actually how identity politics and the threat of violence are in our world remainingly central connected to those in marginalized and therefore threatened groups. And here it kind of gets extended into another group. The whole community is similarly inclusive of terms uh, in terms of gender, sex, and race using pronoun introductions and including people with neurodivergence and other forms of non normative physical and mental ability. What differentiates the two communities is their philosophical approach and how they deal with social situations, one favoring domination and competition, the other favoring communality and cooperation. So both Hopers and Tarsus have understood that identity issues are non-negotiable, no one should assume who and what you are. <clears throat> so progressive science fiction thus represents marginalized positions by adopting clear linguistic approaches to language and world building, but as we've seen, the representation of marginalized groups in the novels also extend towards persons with disability. Which brings me to our next topic and the next author. Lena Richter has not yet published a novel, but co-edits the fanzine Queer Garten with Judith Vogt, as well as working on the gender swapped podcast with them. And in her stories, Fire and 3.78 Life Points, Richter specifically uses science fictional strategies to focus issues of mental and physical health. So I am reading Richter's stories through the lens of disability studies, using Sandy Schalk's definition of disability written with the parentheses to indicate a spectrum, an overarching social system of bodily and mental norms that includes ability and disability. The importance of the term is the rejection of binaries. Um, as Schalk argues, the mutual dependency of disability and ability to define one another. Victor stories explore just this, the shifting definitions of disability, the markers of health and illness that are defined by social contract or how technologies open or close possible worlds within the range of disability. So Fire is the story of an encounter between teenage boy Tarnik and an Amazon warrior named Cyrix, who is being hunted and needs the boy's help. The world is post-apocalyptic with remnants of technology and a form of tribal culture. In the beginning of the story, Tarnik explains that he has a condition he calls the anger, which makes him lash out at people in which he cannot control. It's both physical and a mental condition. The words he uses to describe it are negatively connoted representative of his culture that defines it as a sickness. The anger in me was a monster with too many tentacles. They strangulated my guts, they let my body shiver with wrath, they retched up words from my throat, hateful words, that chopped through the room like arrows and found their target in the wounded eyes of my father. Even though Tariq's family tries to help, there's stigma around them. It's seen as an illness selectively affecting people during puberty. Sirius later tells Tarnik that the anger will grow and eventually kill him if it's not controlled. She also confirms that it's something that most people are ignorant about and that their lack of knowledge is cause of the social stigma. So during an attack, Tarnik feels helpless to aid the Amazon and suddenly realizes that the anger is not just empowering him, um, but also connects him to Sirius. I did not know that I could scream like this, so loud, so full of wrath. All at once, I was on my feet and running forward. I screamed and Cyrix answered. I heard my own cry blending with the cry of the Amazon for a split second, felt like I could feel her heartbeat in my chest, her hear her thoughts in my head. So Cyrix explains that the condition is called the inner fire and is actually an ability that makes the Amazons fierce warriors and connects them in battle, a reference to the original mythology. So the history of it has been lost, but the story hints that it might be a genetic enhancement um, after all, this is what the pursuer is trying to eradicate. He's called a renewer of the old world and seeks to destroy any form of enhanced or post human being, anything with implants or abilities, as Sirix explains. So they find the renewer, Sirix takes Tarnik in and will teach him to control the fire and become stronger because of it. The story deals with disability in that the anger is stigmatized as a threat to normative majority leading the renewer to destroy it in the village to ostracize it. So here, Richter echoes Margaret Childrick's idea that disabled people are alienated from society because of a perceived lack in their status of subjectivity. 
The valued attributes of personhood are autonomy and agency, which includes both a grasp of rationality and control over one's body and a clear distinction between self and other. And um, Sheldon argues. So, thus, any compromised mental or physical organization or stability results in deep seated anxiety. Tonic's inability to control the anger is such a loss of subjectivity in the eyes of those witnessing it. Um, but Sirik's intervention redefines the anger as the inner fire, claims a different kind of embodied reality, and thus, in a sense, is a cripping. Cripping, similar to queering, challenges what Robert McRuer has called compulsory able-bodiedness and seeks to understand the relations of visibility that surround the different terms. Sirix makes visible the embodied difference of those with the inner fire, claiming subjectivity not despite of her difference, but because of it. Picking up on the idea of embodied difference of disability in 3.78 life points, Richter denies the empowering moment of claiming crib. Instead, the story shows how science fiction usually renders invisible disabled bodies by providing technological solutions for what is essentially framed as a problem. As Catherine Allen has pointed out, SF often sees disability as a physical or mental impairment that is supplanted through the application of technology, transforming the disabled body into a figure of prosthetic awe and medicalized prowess. In the story, Richter rejects this erasure and instead exposes the illusions of inviolability and self-mastery over the body that technologized crypt narratives usually uphold. <clears throat> In the story, her non-binary character, Amy, gets a job delivering a package. As the story opens, their serotonin device stops working, as they soon find out, because the social security office has flagged Amy as being uncooperative. Without it, Amy is unable to mentally process the sensory overload that the fully mediated cyberpunk world represents. They get overwhelmed by lights, sounds, and motion. Videos and gifts in streaming color, cute animations of animals, thin bodies jumping up and down in front of a mirror, everything moves. It's too colorful, too bright, too much. Normally, I only notice this at the edge of my consciousness, but the disruption of my implant has pushed my brain into formality of this way too fast. Already at this point, Richter links Amy's disability with their ability to work, form in the capitalist system. As McGrewer argues, this is the main point of the compulsory nature of able-bodiedness in the emergent industrial capitalist system, free to sell one's labor effectively meant free to have an able body. The story makes this explicit by having Amy remember a school teacher, a school teacher claiming that disability such as blindness can be cured. Problems such as this are problems of the past, the woman on the screen, on the screen had said. I remember she continued, by now everyone could work to earn a set of artificial replacements in case of a loss of vision. So able-bodiedness is a necessity to work in the oppressive capitalist system. Because of Amy's cognitive disability, they neglect to comply with the social security office, which results in the device being disconnected. Amy does not own the device outright, but receives it as a disability aid to help them perform a job. So this, the disconnect turns it in, uh, uh, in turn impacts their ability to work. A feedback, sorry, a feedback loop they cannot break out of. So without the implant, it's possible to work, but grueling. Without the implant, I do not manage 60 hours a week. I do not get the highest level evaluations for friendly demeanor. Without those evaluations, I will never succeed in any applications I constantly put out for real jobs, permanent jobs, with access to healthcare systems. This kind of reminds me of academia. Um, Amy's whole existence is centered around making enough life points to warrant better services to move along the projected access to normative behavior. But the events of the day throw them back onto their cognitive impairment. What becomes clear in the story, though the narrative, through the narrative perspective of Amy's position, is that Amy's disability is a social construction. Sensory overload is produced through the capitalist need for advertising. The pressure to work 60 hours and always be superficially nice is socially constructed because society persists in its compulsory able-bodiedness and the need to define norms of behavior. What both stories show is that disability is defined against social and cultural parameters and that we need disabled voices to understand how people with disability are denied subjectivity and what needs to change. So 3.78 life points 
highlights that the neoliberal capitalist system will provide technological solutions to what it perceives as problems, thus erasing and ultimately entrenching disability as a market for otherness. Foyer, on the other hand, shows it might work to change the cultural perception of what it constitutes embodiment, thus accepting the whole spectrum of disabled bodies as human. <clears throat> so my last example really evaluates the larger structure of the fantastic. In this case, the generic conventions of utopian literature. As Ingel Konitz has pointed out, German SF tends towards literature as dark mirrors of society, and thus towards the dystopian form. However, <coughs> in its seemingly inexorable move towards the post-apocalyptic and its appetite for bleak nihilism, it risks jettisoning the joyful celebration of human potential and losing its capacity to generate awe and wonder. Cornelius warns that much dystopia, that too much dystopia will eventually yield diminishing returns and leave audiences without hope for a better future. German SF, so the summary position, has been traditionally too dark to produce the principle of hope, as Ernst Bloch has famously called utopian dreaming. In her novel Pantopia, Theresa Hannig leaves behind German nihilism for Bloch's principle of hope, exploring the positive change necessary for us to solve the climate catastrophe, as well as the rampant social inequality that plagues 21st century societies. The utopian future of the novel sees the creation of a global state based on the principles of the Human Rights Charter, which grants rights to every person. For Pantopia, then, certain principles exist. Pantopia is pacifist and sets saving the planet from destruction as its primary goal. Individual freedoms are curtailed by the principles of the common, meaning you can do what you like unless it contradicts the principles of equality, pacifism, or ecological conservatism. Everyone will receive a universal basic income, but in return, everyone will become participant in the Pantopian economic system, which is built not on the current capitalist markets, but adjusted to include the world price of commodities, which taxes any behavior that is in contradiction to Pantopia's principles. So if you destroy the environment making the commodity, that destruction is priced into the commodity. If you pay lower than living wage and thus the cost of living in the, uh, and thus cost lives in the process, that is priced in and so forth. And lastly, all policy is fully transparent. All members of Pantopia have voting rights in its discussion and implementation, a direct democracy with technology. So for the purpose of this talk, I'm not interested in the utopian world itself, though that is interesting, but rather in the generic traditions that Hamlet addresses and re-evaluates in line with the ideals of the progressive fantastic. In his book, Utopias and Nonfiction, Simon Spiegel has an excellent chapter on the generic conventions of utopia, which I'm basing my analysis on. As genres change over time with use, Spiegel charts their structure from classical utopias to socialist utopias to dystopias and finally to critical utopias. Classical utopias describe isolated societies set apart from the world, static without much need for change. Their societies are built on conformity and uniformity, leaving no margin for deviance. As such, their citizens are made for utopia, educated to its values. Narratively, most utopias are rather boring. Reading a travelogue um, with descriptions of policy and infrastructure instead of actual characters or action. So over time, utopias shift from being geographically apart to being set in the future. With the 20th century, then it comes the shift towards a dystopian form, which is kind of still, I mean, it concentrates on conflict of deviant beliefs and brought in with more dynamic storytelling. And as Cornelius has described, this is still the mode that dominates utopian writing today. It's outlook centering on the negative effects of current trends. Um, and lastly, Spiegel points out that functionally, utopias are mainly critique of current society, a critical diagnosis of the time. Hanich rejects the dystopian mode outright, reclaiming positive and hopeful visions of the future for, for the progressive fantastic. Pantopia is one of the green shoots of hope that Cornelius identifies in his writing. Set in, in Germany, the story takes place in the near future, just rejecting the distance and isolation used in utopian fiction, instead realizing 
Halle is aiming to stress the social function of Utopia as a critical diagnosis. She uses what Sweden calls the two world structure, which counterpositions an old world onto which the critique and grievances are placed, and a new world to which to explore the will to improve, pointing out that a different path is possible. So, but in removing the isolation and the distance, Hamish allows readers to clearly identify one of the worlds as their own, which is unlike what uh, the distant, for example, the distant planets Uras and Anares in Ursula Le Guin's critical utopia that the dispossessed, right? So we actually recognize the bad world as the one that we're living in. Um, in this respect, Pantopia is like the original novel Utopia, as Spiegel points out, in some respects closer to a philosophical tract or political manifesto. Pantopia can be read as a political treatise on solutions to social inequality and climate catastrophe. The only science fictional novel in the novel is Einbach, the st emerging strong AI that implements these solutions. As such, Pantopia, similar to Kim Stanley Robinson's The Ministry for the Future, functions as a serious counterproposal, a fictional work at least partly conceived as serious political program. I contend that Hannich wants her readers to take the political alternatives in Pantopia seriously. And she's hoping for implementation. As Spiegel points out, since Utopia already achieved stability, the conflict of how to get there is never addressed. If it really were a matter of implementing the utopian blueprint, this would actually be the most interesting phase, Spiegel says. And Hannich is explicitly interested in just that, in providing her readers with this phase, which she focuses her novel on. In the novel, we witness the status quo and how Einbach becomes an emergent strong AI. Einbach realizes the need for intervention and sets in motion a flurry of actions, um, gathering money, securing his service in Antarctica to be out of national reach, building a model island in the Mediterranean to convince citizens to join the world state. Einbach also calculates the ways that nation states and political, industrial, and media elites will fight against the Pantopian world state. In this, we see another deviance uh, and from utopian traditions, and Hamish focuses on the conflict between the two systems, enacts the resistance to the utopian state, and explores just how such a utopia deals with deviants, with the people who still have false needs and dislike new order as we do things. So as we can see, Hamish reevaluates not just the traditions of narrative and content that are entrenched in the fantastic genre, but he purposefully turns on the structural program of utopian fiction. Instead of showing the reader the better place, Hannich explores the messy part of how we get there. Um, and thus makes it explicit that change is possible, that all the options we need to enact in a utopian system are already at our grasp. So to conclude, I hope to have shown that the German fantastic genres, a kind of political shift has occurred, a new mindset has taken root to see not just generic traditions, but actual fields of experimentation. And lastly, let me say that these texts I discussed here are examples from SF uh, and just from a small sample of authors. But there are more, and I encourage you to explore widely what the German Fantastic has to offer. And here are some starting points, a little bit more fantasy, urban fantasy, mythology. Um, so there's a, a bit for everyone here. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Arthur. It's excellent. Um, from the online audience. <laughs> well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, right. Uh, so we'll do um, a question and answer. And if there's anyone online that would like to ask any questions, um, we have Dimitra uh, on the computer, and she will be able to kind of pick them up and throw them out to the, to the room. Uh, but does anyone have anything that they'd like to, to start with? Please. I'm going to search uh, for this fantastic uh, book. Was there any thread about religion? Because you talked about that now they try to put other genders, they try to give a new view about disability. But is there any combination like to spirituality, to God? How these new authors connect to it? Um, the text that I have here, the only one that somehow touches upon religion would be wasteland 
but religion there like for the for the toxic community has kind of become well there because the an apocalypse happened there's a disconnect towards the world before and the religious aspect is that the toxers are actually uh kind of have a deity called the wi-fi so they're they're exploring kind of our interconnected globalized world as as if we were actually seeing a deity right so we, if we think of how we interact with the with the internet and, the, and our devices it to them from the perspective of post apocalypse seems like that might be a deity so they they kind of see the all-empowering wi-fi as a god um, out of those four or out of those texts right here that's probably the only religious aspect that i would see um, if you're looking uh, for more religion i mean this one right here is uh, a mythology rereading of uh, the war of troy so there this is actually a living gods of the greek uh, mythology walking the earth um, there's a lot of religion there um one of the others um i don't think religion is that key a topic at the moment in the joke yes, no. but we gave me some ideas about Oh, I don't um, oh, Matt, sorry, did you want to jump in? <laughs> cool. So, actually, yeah, related to that, made me think of it. Um, the, the point text, the, yeah. the paupers and the toxins, mm -hmm. something you said about both of the communities sharing the same progressive kind of queer linguistics made me wonder. They have very different social systems, I think, in your yeah. description, right? They're very different power structures, so everything is very different and antagonistic, but they share the same linguistic queer structures. Yeah. So I was wondering what you thought about that in terms of what it might suggest about the relationship of those kinds of linguistic structures to social power relations, right? If, if two completely different, one very hierarchical, one presumably not, can have the same linguistic structures, are they sort of abstracted from everything that goes on beneath them? Oh, okay. Can I so just interject for one second? The audience online is asking if, if we could repeat the questions yes. facing this way. Sorry, so the, should have said that before you asked all of that, Reese. Yes. yes. So the, the question was uh, in Wasteland, and I actually it is true for Asian space as well, if there are queer linguistic structures uh, in place with very different social groups, if there is a, a I suppose what you know, to what extent does that suggest? That these are completely abstract, right? From from every from yeah. all the other social structures that are going on. Okay, so yeah, the, the question of how those those queer linguistic structures kind of even relate to the social structures, basically. Mm -hmm. And I think it's in, in Asian space, it's very interesting. And Kristen has mentioned this in an interview uh, that we've done. Um, in Asian space, it's a community of space jockeys, like you know, um, fighter pilots kind of thing. Uh, and they're kind of fighting on against the corporate structure. And we have a, a similar development at the moment, right? Corporate structures are taking on social identities. They're kind of implementing that. So they, they see that there's a consensus about, uh, um, you know, heteronormativity. They see that non-heteronormativity is becoming a consensus, so they're employing it, but they're still underneath problematic in other aspects. So. I think that that's kind of where they're pushing this is the idea that even though one aspect can become better, like linguistically, we all accept, you know, I'm not assuming you're a he, I'm just asking you for it first, right? Um, so I'm, I'm going, you know, I'm becoming more aware on this doesn't mean that I cannot still be toxic in other aspects. Mm -hmm. And this kind of goes for the intersectionality aspect. I mean, there's this. Um, there's this very famous example of intersectionality that the queen is very, very privileged, and yet because she's a woman, she can still be misogynistically put down in, in parts, right? So I think this is kind of where they're headed with this, that on some level, we might all be getting towards the point of seeing a social identity as something that we, we need to factor in, but it doesn't mean that toxic behavior doesn't still exist somewhere. So I think uh, it's the different levels of how far we go with this. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I, if, I, I'm not really sure if the authors are there, but if they want to jump in, they can. <laughs> <laughs>
a, a, a tiny follow-up question, which would just be, how popular are these texts? Well, this is actually a question I get, I have gotten the, the other times I've talked about this before. And um, unfortunately, all of German science fiction, as I've said in the beginning, isn't really being, you know, the it's not the best-selling uh, number one New York Times kind of thing. And there are very few novels in German science fiction which actually even break that mold of becoming international. So, but within the field of science fiction, these texts are kind of like coming up. So it's a, it's a well, if you think back a couple of years in the US market, the discussion of the, the set puppies, right? So it's a, it's a changing of the guard kind of that's coming up, right? So there are older authors who kind of still hang on to their stuff and they're more, uh, um, more well written, well known. These authors here are kind of pushing, moving the, the, the baseline of what is interesting writing in this. So they're kind of changing the, the, the view of this. But overall, uh, in terms of pure numbers, these are probably very niche at the moment. Even within the German Yes, SF. even within the German SF. But like I said, right, they're, they're, it's, it's something that is changing. And this is actually why I'm interested in it, because it's for the first time I'm researching something that is happening right now. So being kind of on the ground floor of a changing uh, a, a literary movement or a literary uh, scene, kind of making shifts and, and so on. I'm not 100% sure if in 10 years we're going to look at this and go like, oh, that was a fad. Or if in 10 years we're going to go look at this and like, yeah, that's how the, I don't know, we, we started it all. So I'm just interested in seeing that something is shifting and is doing something. So I'm not a very good historian at, at in my research. I usually stick with stuff that is very recent. So this is how this kind of came about. But that said, um, the latest novel by, uh, or the, the novel that I have here, for example, by Judith and Christian, Anarchy Deco has just uh, been nominated for several uh, German SF awards. So there is a recognition by readers that this is uh, going in places. So. Can you talk a little bit more about the sort of cross-cultural exchanges? Sort of, you talk about models being translated out of German, but what, what comes in in terms of sort of novels and other kinds of influences? Because I'm thinking about when the sort of similar movements happen in Anglophone, um, and sort of Anglophone fantasy and science fiction, there's a tradition of like Delaney, Le Guin, Butler to, yeah. to sort of part back to in some ways. Are those novels translated into German or is it sort of part Carmine and Asimov? And um, there might be some stuff you want to say about other media as well. I think yeah, there's some film influences coming Okay, yeah. So I mean, the, the question is how much how much English language SF comes into the German market and how that influences these, uh, um, this movement. So on the one hand, Talking literary and talking uh, cinematic SF is a very different thing because cinematic SF has kind of become the mainstream thing for everyone. Right? So if you look at the German uh, movie rankings, uh, cinematic SF is kind of all the way up there. Right? So out of the 10 best grossing films in Germany, there's like eight of, of them are from the SF market. Um, so German films being produced in Germany, much, much harder, but that's a very different talk. <laughs> so there, there are much different aspects kind of going in here. And Roland Emmerich is one of the examples doing German SF in the 1980s, not getting anywhere, moving to the US, becoming the independent state kind of Hollywood thing, right? Moonfall's the latest, right? So that, that is German SF technically, because he's a German producer and director. In terms of literariness, um, Ursula Le Guin's uh, Left Hand of Darkness and The Dispossessed, for example, have just gotten uh, reissued with new translations. So there is uh, an awareness of a lot of uh, SF traditions. You will be able to read Heinlein, you will be able to read Delaney, all of those in, in, in English. So these are actual influences. I know, for example, James Sullivan is deeply influenced by Samuel Delaney because he's one of the authors that he mentions a lot as, as an influence. I know uh, you and Christian read uh, Joanna Russ, uh, they, they do read uh, the Guin, so stuff like that is a, a strong influence in what they're doing. Um, on the other hand, a lot of the, the current SF in Anglophone literature that is more progressive, I'm looking at Lili Okolo for um, NK Jemis and stuff like that, is also being translated, sometimes even by the same people. I mean, and Judith Cook is actually translating as well, right? So, um, they are, the German SF and F market is kind of very tight. So it's, it's kind of, you know, you throw a stone and you get someone. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so these, these things are being translated, but they are actually suffering from the same problem. 
Um, M.K. Jemison's books are amazing and great, but very few German SF readers have probably read them. So they're suffering from the same problem, right? They're being translated into small publishers, not getting picked up on any big lists, even though they're really, really worth reading. But uh, maybe Okola was Binti is, uh, it just kind of slid by, nobody read it. And it's an amazing story. So um, they're having the same issues, right? Progressive texts in German SF need more of an audience. They need this push, which is one of the reasons I'm standing here. Right? I'm trying to give that no nudge. Um, see the uh, book that you're talking about, Wasteland, when they try and do the completely gender neutral language. Mm -hmm. How do you find that as a reading experience? Is it quite irritating regularly, or do you just get into it and it reads naturally after a while? Or do you find it a strange and an exciting way that it's constantly like, you know, like how, how does that work? Because I'm trying, like, sometimes that, you know, like reading a clockwork orange, for example, you get into yeah, it and you're feeling it, even if it's different from. What you're used to, but sometimes these things can be lines. Yeah, so the question is how do gender uh, non heteronormative languages, how do they read as a reading experience? And um, I won't say it's it's like completely natural when you just start off because the, the, there is a moment. I mean, this is actually one of the, the queer uh, um, subversive strategies is to push the idea that usually this should be male. Now it's actually female marked. So it, there's this moment of recognition that this shouldn't be like this, right? It's, it's, it's uh, um, usually it's their boss, and now all of a sudden it's the boss. Uh, that doesn't make sense, right? But it's only that little break and moment which makes you think, which is actually wanted. But as soon as that is over, you kind of move into the story because they are um, future worlds. It actually makes sense. I mean, you're, 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 you're hearing Root talk, the, the shaman, and you're thinking like, wow, that guy has a, what? He's talking about the Wi-Fi as being a god? What? What is he talking about? You already have this, right? I mean, this is science fiction reading. It's, you're already decoding on several levels. So within science fiction, non heteronormative language doesn't recognize or doesn't register as being too out there. Because SF actually makes it possible to put this in much, much more naturally. Interestingly, in Anarchy Deco, which actually plays in the 1920s in Berlin, Mm -hmm. They also do non-heteronormative language, but historical into that language. Like, and it's much, much harder to do, but it feels much smoother because it just, you know, you, you never, uh, and they really kind of try to fiddle up a way to kind of push it in there and, and get, it, get it in, into this historical la uh, language. And it works. And I haven't read uh, the latest one yet, which they go back to Viking times to do that. So I'm not really sure how that works, but I'm, I'm guessing it also moves pretty smoothly. There's a question from, from the online um, attendants with a German word that I probably will murder now. Is the German progressive fantastic an alternative or maybe Gegenentwurf in German? In yes. okay. in German to the status quo of the fantastic, because it's often suggested that the German fantastic is some, some sort of behind or cut off from the international. So it's, it's yeah, it's a similar question to yes. but slightly differently inflected. So, so the question is, how does how does this relate to what normally happens in, in German SF? And as I've said, in German SF, you, most of it is very conservative in a way. A lot of the, the big selling authors are actually writing thrillers that look a little bit science fiction -y. So you add a little technology here and there, but it basically is a crime procedural like kind of thing, or a spy novel or whatever. So um, the unique science fictionness of, of uh, a lot of science fiction then is more conservative in terms of you know picking up the uh, the great engineer of Heinlein and that kind of thing. So there's a lot of intermixing going on, but I would not say that German. SNF or SFF authors are just copying trends from like five years ago. I would actually say what they're trying to do, and they've always been trying to do, is find a way to make the German genre reverberate with the international one, but adding in the Germanness of it. And a good example of this is actually from cinematic. So if you're looking at television, Dark as a TV series is playing with a lot of time travel uh, narratives. And, and if you're doing science fiction, as a scholar of science fiction, we all know about the meta narratives, right? We all know about uh, um, um, how, there's, how there are parabolas of SF that we are dealing with. So if you are dealing with time travel, obviously you're going to think of the DeLorean. You're going to think of, you know, H.G. Uh, Wells' time machine. You're going to think of all of these. And 
You can't do time travel without the bootstraps by Heinlein, stuff like that. But Dark actually manages to take this idea of time travel and make it uniquely German in the sense that the claustrophobia of the press, the, 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 you know, it's all about like these three families all sitting on each other in this little village kind of thing. That's so German. And the whole thing just reads so German that it's not a usual SF story from the US. And I think this is exactly what these authors are trying to do, is trying to find a way to acknowledge that they, they know about the, the world out there, but still kind of try to connect to, to the Germanness of it. Um, a good example of this is actually Lektorkausen, which is kind of like a Ghostbuster story from a small town in Germany in, in the Rhein Main Gebiet. Uh, so it's, it actually plays out in the 1980s, and it's an uh, African, Afro German uh, uh, woman who's a Ghostbuster and who, who notices that a lot of the German ghosts are Nazis. <laughs> because, I mean, that's where the history hangs around, right? I mean, that's what we do. So, this is kind of a, a very Germanness to the story. So, there's a, a, this kind of interconnection between international on the one side, German on the other, kind of bringing them together. Dystopian, and uh, I'm not really familiar with this kind of science fiction. Uh, but what I can think of is brain, brain new work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, because I'm studying the media of the internet, so I wonder whether there is a way to adapt the, this um, science, science fiction to films uh, and uh, in country like China because if there are many policies uh, uh, against the uh, novels contain some some content like um, um, anti-human anti-social anti and uh, um, like you have to say queer, queer and uh, homosexual and like this and do you think there's a way to make it more popular, to especially in market like China? So the, the question is, if these were, if it was, if it were possible to do these as films or, or television series, and how their content uh, yeah, might be that well. Uh, yeah. So for for, I mean, for stories like uh, um, the ones where we're talking about queer heteronormative language, yeah. to to not make them queer for for different markets would be problematic. But that will work, right? But in general, all of these kind of because they are within a specific market at the moment. For all of these, the problem is remains the same that German television and film producers are even more conservative. So getting them to kind of see this as a possibility to make something is even harder, right? So getting someone published is already hard enough. Getting them translated into a different language then has to you know, convince the other publisher as well. Also another step that is really, really problematic. Making this into a television or film series or just a film is even more problematic because you need much, much more money, much, much more money in very conservative hands just wanting to. So the, the guaranteed turnover is the problem, right? Um, but I do think actually some of those stories are worth taking a look at. Um, Anna Hidi Kohl is like a, a there's a, a German TV series, one of the most probably well known internationally, which is called Babylon Berlin, which plays in the 1920s, deals with the, you know, the political upheaval of the time right before the, the world's crash, the, the economic crash. And Anakhidi co plays in the same time frame in Berlin, very free society, but introduces magic as well. So kind of makes for a, a, a carnival role kind of feeling, right? So there's a, it, I think it would be very televised, televisual in a sense, but it, it's obviously hard to kind of sell that story, right? So we'll, we'll see where that goes. But I, I think there's potential there for, for television adaptations, yes. How popular is Netflix in Germany? Probably the same as here. Because there's, I mean, Netflix is, you know, has a lot, a lot of internet shows of this kind. Of well, interestingly, after the success of Dark, mm -hmm. there have so far only been two other TV series in German production that even remotely touched the SFF angle. There's Tribes of Europa, which probably bombed pretty well because it's really strange. 
And then there's biohackers, which kind of goes more into the biopunk uh, thing. I haven't seen that yet. But there is, it's not like after the success of Dark, there were like hundreds of people, you know, scouting German as an FF and F. So I, I don't know what happened, but somehow the boom kind of moved into a different direction. Maybe we can get it back up. I don't know. <laughs> there's one more question here. Um, Moving away from science fiction, I would appreciate a brief comment on how fantasy has developed. I mentioned a bit, a, a bit on that. I remember about 10, uh, 10 to 15 years ago, authors like Marcus Heitz mm -hmm. and Bernard Hennen mm -hmm. uh, were very prominent in German bookstores, and we see them translated into English. But has the fantasy genre developed in similar ways to this uh, science fiction genre? Okay, so the question is um, how, the, how this relates to the fantasy genre and how the development there is. Um, so in the 19, around the 2000s, because of the to Lord of the Rings uh, films by Peter Jackson, um, there's a huge interest in, um, there's actually a British author who kind of started it with, uh, I think, a, a series called The Orcs, right? And I think it's, it's just, uh, do I have this right? Um, and then it, it's, it's in German, this actually made publishers go, oh, this is a good series, this actually goes, this, this looks and sounds like Tolkien, but it's newer, so we can actually market this. And they went out scouting for um, what in German is called Völker fantasy. So it's race fantasy, right? So the idea of different races, orcs, elves, that kind of thing. And Bernard Hennen, Markus Heitz, uh, Christoph Hadebusch, these people started writing Basically, anything you can think of, the trolls, the dwarves, the elves, or whatever, there's a series of it, series after series. And they're kind of, I mean, this is basically a trope becoming so stale that nobody really, I mean, they still find audiences a lot. And they, that's why they're being translated, because there's a lot of this going on. But on the other hand, there's very little innovation in it. But, and that's actually where the original, um, the Elfenmagier by James Sutherland is actually the tweet that kind of set it off. He wanted to write a Tolkien-inspired high fantasy without becoming one of the next, you know, let's talk about race things. So he, he actually wrote, uh, his, his debut is The Elves, or actually I think it's called The Elven in English. It's actually been translated. He co-wrote that with Bernard Hannon, and it's, it's been one of the novels that has, you know, it's part of this German uh, fantasy boom of the 2000s. But he wanted to move away from this and kind of revisit the idea of the album. But look at the stuff that got left out the last time. And um, so this is what kind of started the initial process of developing the ideas of the progressive fantasy. And um, that's kind of where, where, where we're headed with this. So uh, and as you can see here, um, urban fantasy, you know, uh, high fantasy, mythological fantasy, we're moving in this direction. That there's more going on here that, that, that authors are trying to push the, the envelope on that as well. And um, according to um, Sullivan and Fogt, uh, fantasy is actually the genre where it might be even more interesting because there's so much more traditions there. So it's much more of a need of an overhaul. I would disagree. I actually, I actually think science fiction can be just as conservative and just needs as much of an overhaul, which is why I concentrated on it. But I, that's for another debate, probably. <laughs> Yeah, it's difficult, isn't it? Because it can be conservative in a futuristic way, yeah, which is deceptive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. As it looks like the future, but still kind of feels like the past in a way. Yeah. I have more. Just what, how long are we allowed to keep going for? Um, we're booked. They're not going to kick us out until half six, so we are okay if we have more questions. Yeah, and I'll move on the break right now. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, I have a, a, a question then. So. It's not going to be very well. It's, it's a little too unbeatable, I'm afraid. But this is more of a comment than a question. No, <laughs> no, no, it is a question. Um, okay, so the, the thing with dystopias traditionally is that they allow for more individualistic kind of agency, right? That there is a kind of focus on the protagonist and fighting against the system and so on, but it's post political. And there's obvious reasons why that resonates with contemporary political kind of desire and obviously I think why it would be a fitting place for some of your kind of more progressive tropes right yeah. because because a lot of these things are kind of identity based so they're kind of political um like progressive politics but, but, but from a, a, a kind of an individual kind of stance often and I find it interesting that the utopia from your description I don't, I don't 
on plant yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, with a, a global state with yes, you know, like limits on individual liberty and so on. Do you see a tension there um, in, in the kind of direction that these things are going in? Uh, no, actually, I think that's that's completely. I mean, this is one of the things, right? We we are looking at dystopias and find them more interesting because we are so ingrained in the idea of individualism, because we're so ingrained of finding solutions for ourselves. I mean, think about it. You're driving an electric car because you think climate control, climate change is actually something that you can do. Right? That's why you, that's your individual choice. I can do this. Whereas you know the, the U.S. military is the one that's actually doing it. So individualism and dystopia work hand in hand. That's why there's so many of them, because it gives us the feeling of we as individuals can change something. The cool thing about pantopia or the, the utopian moment here is that it is, um, I'm, I'm using actually uh, in, a, in a longer version of this chapter, basically, if it ever becomes a book. <laughs> um, I actually want to explore the idea of what Mo Monika Bielski has called prototopia. And one of the, the aspects that she's concentrating on is that we need narratives of communal change. We can't change things individually. We need community. We need to all of us pull together. And this is exactly what the book says, right? The individual uh, in itself can't really do much. But if we all pull together, I mean, this is the idea of unions. This is the idea of, you know, a lot of social change that we have done, which is being pulled apart by individual neoliberalism. The less of a community we are, the easier it's to kind of scatter us. So the more community we have, the more utopian whatever we're doing becomes. So I don't think it's a it's a contradiction, or a, I think it actually fits really nicely to what this uh, this change of what the progressive wants. And so this is also why in wasteland community is so important, or in ace in space. This is why uh, um, Mura is actually changing. You know, she's not just doing it alone, but she's turning people, turning people, turning people to become a community. So the idea of communalism instead of individualism is something that is driving the ideas of the progressive as well. And I think this is actually true for, if you're looking at, uh, um, at stories from the US market as well, where community becomes much, much, I mean, I'm thinking of Cory Doctorow's walk away, right? Where it's not the individual, but it's kind of a movement that changes things. Mm -hmm. um, Kim Stanley Robinson's uh, uh, Ministry for the Future, where the individual is kind of lost before this mountain of things that needs to be done. And yet, because everyone is doing their part and everyone communally does it, we're doing it together. Mm -hmm. So I think this idea of community is actually something that's key for all of this. So how would you sort of define, <coughs> sorry about this question in advance, how would you define community in opposition to a collection of individuals? Um, and there's, there's a specific <laughs> reason for that. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, <clears throat> Wait, let me get my philosophy degree. Uh, yes. <laughs> because walk away, no, the reason I ask is so walk away, for example, yes. right? Is, is, is very much a kind of anarcho liberalist yes. stance, right? Everyone is highly individualistic in that text. They just all happen to be going in the same direction. Yes and no, right? So they, they are highly individually motivated, but the communities they build are actually higher value than the individual. Mm -hmm. So for, for them, it's more important to save the community. Than to to you know get their individual will of things. Mm. So uh, when when they're being attacked, it's it's the community that that kind of pulls together and moves somewhere else. It's not individual scattering. It's everybody coming together and moving. Mm. So I don't think that's actually you know uh, individualism doesn't necessarily mean uh, that we can't build a community. So definition of community. I mean you don't have to. I, I think <laughs> that's kind of, very I think it kind of goes with the question of how much we communicate about differences and goals. Mm -hmm to accept differences, but still concentrate on what we want to accomplish together. Mm -hmm. So you can be a green uh, wanting you know, to, to change uh, climate, to address climate change and kind of shift it. Uh, uh, and I can be a, a very forward thinking liberal kind of saying, I have a technological solution. We can still come together in the sense that we want to change something about the climate. Mm -hmm. I mean, at least that's hopefully the ideal that the German government is trying to pull to at the moment. Not seeing that, not seeing the neoliberal techno utopian yeah. visions going in the same direction at the moment, but that's kind of where they're headed or wanted to head. But maybe that's the, my definition of community that's kind of. But, I mean, this is why it's a, a really interesting question to me because, um, so you know, the German approach to climate change, for example, right, the, the, the kind of solar revolution and so on, it, you know, this idea that the state would act as a midwife in some sense yeah. to, the, to the market. 
right? So you have this tension in Germany between this kind of like highly individualistic capitalist kind of market-led yeah. change, but with the state as a sort of midwife, let's say. To yeah, that. I mean, it's, it's obviously the, uh, the idea of the politics in Germany there has obviously changed over the last 50 or 60 years, right? So uh, the, the social market, uh, the social market capitalism that we had in the 1960s and 70s through the whole 1980s neoliberal revolution kind of thing, and then the third way Democrats kind of, it's a bit problematic, but generally thinking, yes, I think in, in most of non anglophone countries. So if you're looking at not just Germany, but also um, the Netherlands or Sweden or Denmark, uh, the idea that the state has regulatory power and can push for specific technologies to be given a boom and others, Given the uh, um, a single word, uh, yeah, a damper or whatever, yeah, like restricted, right? So the idea is something that is that is part of, let's say, Central European democracies post World War II, and it's more in some countries and less than others, depending on the, on the. But in general, the idea that complete neoliberal freedom, like Thatcher and Reagan have implemented it in the US and the UK has kind of led in the wrong direction. And I, I mean, looking at the, the state of infrastructure in the North, uh, in, in the UK, I am kind of saying, yeah, that might be a problem. <laughs> right? Because, you know, London London has a, that, the new Elizabethan line tube station, and Leeds is, you know, still running on uh, fumes on, on bus systems. So I, there is a problem here, uh, which the state can obviously help uh, regulate a little bit. I can keep going. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could too, but we could yeah, probably, yeah, no, we can probably do that over a <laughs> yeah. um, I, I just I wanted to bring it to the bookstore, to be said, because that, that was a little bit of, it's kind of a long preface, right? Because the question ultimately is, in these German science fiction texts, yes. how does that relationship play out? So between the state and the... And the individual, I suppose, yeah. I mean, oh. that, that's the kind of loving for me, because in Pantopia, for example, the idea of the AI, yeah. It's it's kind of it's one of those um, it's like a black box, right? Yeah. Like you know, it, it focuses on how the change happens, well, but it also doesn't in a sense. Yeah, and it, it, I mean that, that's actually the cop out. Mm -hmm. I mean that is that exactly. is the techno utopian cop out, right? Is the, the AI is going to fix it? Yeah. It's a techno utopian fix, mm -hmm. and I actually told this to Teresa at some point that that's actually my biggest problem with it is that the, the AI fixes it, yeah. and I'm not hundred percent sure that we're actually. I mean. The good thing is nobody's actually programming this AI to do it. It's just an emerging AI. So something completely different figures out the idea that, you know, this is not going in the right direction. Let me change that, which is a nice touch, right? So the, the AI is actually developed as a neoliberal financial tool to make the most money. And it comes up with the idea as to make the most money, humans have to be alive. <laughs> Otherwise, I can't make money. That doesn't make sense. So it's the opposite of what Ted Chiang described in his uh, in his article where he talks about an AI that is supposed to produce uh, strawberries and comes up with the idea of getting rid of all the humans, just making strawberry fields is the best thing to do. And so this is the opposite of it. And the opposite is the AI realizes to make its goal of making as much money as possible, humans have to be there. Us out of the question, no more money. Right? Who needs it? And that, that's actually the, the fail of Ketchum's story is an AI that was supposed to do all of those strawberries, for what? What's the reason that humans can't consume it anymore? Right? So there's a, it's, a, it's a conceptual question of what AI does or doesn't do. So I think that's so that it's a little bit better than a cop out, but I I still do agree that an AI is a black box. We can't really think about you know how does it actually come about, but it remains true that all of the solutions that the AI is implementing are the ones that we already have. We know this. We know that our production of uh, um, stuff that actually hurt, hurts the environment should be more expensive. Right? So if I'm using a car with uh, uh, diesel in it, and I'm using up the earth, and I'm destroying the earth in the process, that should be much, much more expensive than somebody going on a bike. And yet, the German government just gave out a lot, a lot of money to the people driving cars instead of the people driving bikes. So, right, so there's, a, there's a change there that is possible, and 
It just takes the AI to make it happen. But yes, uh, technically all of the solutions in the model could be implemented by us because we already know. We just don't want to do it. <laughs> so the AI makes us do it. There's some resonances with Asimov's robot. <laughs> yeah, yes, I was, I was actually thinking of Robbie on the on the station, and the, the you know he has to send the beam to whatever, and and he's completely going nuts over it, and the, and the, the personnel is going, oh, oh, we can't let this happen, and he, he locks them in and does it anyway because he has a very much a better reason for it. So this is kind of what we're hoping for, right? We're hoping for AI not to be the Skynet version. We're hoping for it to be so beneficial to us. That it realizes we're just fumbling idiots and we need saving. I'm not, not sure it's a better version of the future. Okay. Any final questions? Okay. Well, Thank you for attending my ramblings. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.